This video is going to cover interactions. So let me start out with where this fits in the whole course. So what we've been doing so far um, recently is trying to address nonlinearities. So as an example, maybe I have a scatter plot that looks like this and clearly it's curved. Um, it's not a linear relationship between X and Y. So we we learned about how to include a transformation of the X to straighten this relationship out. All right, well, one way to think about interactions is that it's a multivariate version of these nonlinearities. So an interaction is fundamentally a nonlinear combination between two or more predictor variables. Uh, so, you know, if, if we go back to our, our, our paper here, um, we've been handling linear regression, which means this, you know, beta naught, beta 1 times x1, beta 2 times x2, and then maybe you have some errors in there as well. All right. This y is a linear function of x. All right, now what, where we're really going um, now is y is equal to some arbitrary nonlinear function or some specific nonlinear function is probably a better way to say that that involves both x1 and x2 plus some errors. All right, so then how do we handle this? So one way to think about um, this, another really important way to think about this is that the relationship between some variable x and y depends on the other x. Okay, so that's implied by this nonlinear um, uh, you know, definition. So um, maybe I, that, that's so important, um, I, I better write it for you. So the relationship between y and x1 depends, it depends on x2. Um, one way to see this is let's go back to my linear equation. And if I were to take the partial derivative of this with respect to x1, what do I get? So this is, you know, how does y get affected by x1? Well, the answer to this is, is just beta 1, right? So um, the, the way that y changes with respect to x1, if I, if I you know, change x1, what happens to y? Well, the answer is it, it, it's a constant. It doesn't depend on x2 at all. Likewise, the partial of this with respect to x2, that's a partial sign, is just beta 2, which doesn't depend on x1. Does not depend on x1. With an interaction, we're going to see that these partial derivatives actually do depend on the other variable. So, my favorite example of this is, um, is on the Wikipedia page. This is a very good uh, page, and if you search for coffee, they give a, kind of an everyday example of an interaction. So what Wikipedia claims is that um, there's an interaction between adding sugar to coffee and stirring it. So neither of the two uh, individual variables has much effect on the sweetness, but the combination does. So uh, if you don't believe me, let's go sketch this out. So let's say I have uh, a plot, and this is the amount of sugar that I add to my coffee. And then on the, on the y-axis, we're going to plot the sweetness. So how sweet is my coffee? So this is where I put in zero um, teaspoons of sugar, and then I could put in, you know, more sugar. All right. Now, there's another factor, um, which is, do I stir it? Yes or no? So stir, uh, yes or no? Now, let's just um, uh, consider for a moment what happens if I put zero teaspoons of sugar in my coffee and I don't stir it. Well, how sweet is it? 
And maybe there's some inherent sweetness to the coffee, so it's maybe just a tiny bit sweet. If I were to put, um, you know, um, uh, you know, one teaspoon of sugar in, uh, you know, uh, and and let's say I, um, I I don't stir it. Well, um, if you've ever done this, you'll know that the sugar will much of the sugar will just sink to the bottom, um, and so it won't get uh, dissolved in the coffee. So maybe if I put one teaspoon of sugar in. Uh, you know, I don't stir it, it becomes a little sweet. And if I put two teaspoons in, maybe it becomes a little sweet, sweeter still. And so this is where I do not stir. So stir equals no. Now, I'm going to use red to indicate what happens if I do stir. So let's say I have a cup of coffee and I, um, I put zero teaspoons of sugar in, but I stir it vigorously. How, uh, how sweet is it going to be? Well, it will have the exact same sweetness as if I didn't stir it. What if I put one teaspoon of sugar in, but I stir it? Well, the answer is it's going to be sweeter because, uh, you know, with the stirring, it actually gets dissolved in there and it becomes sweeter. And if I put two teaspoons in, it becomes uh, sweeter still. All right, so this is stir equals yes. Now, I'd like to point out the relationship between, uh, you know, sweetness and x1, so let's say amount of sugar is x1, depends on the value of my other x, which is whether I stir it or not. So this is like x2. So x2 equals yes, or x2 is equal to no. So call that one and zero if you like. So if I stir, the relationship is quite steep. If I don't stir, the relationship is quite flat, flat. And so if you think about it, you know, the partial derivative of sweetness with respect to the amount of sugar I put in is one value. If I don't stir, it's another value. It's a much steeper value if I do stir. All right, so this is an illustration of an, uh, of an interaction. If we go back to Wikipedia for a second, you'll see they give a lot of other examples where, um, okay, if you, um, if you add carbon to steel and you quench it, uh, it's going to be much, uh, much stronger than if you just uh, added carbon or quenched, but you didn't do both. Likewise, if you um, smoke, and you inhale asbestos, you're much more likely to get cancer than if you just do one of the two. So do not do both of those for sure. Um, they give several other examples. All right, well, now let's go back to the course packet. Um, I've, I've mapped out all the math for us here, but um, sometimes it, it, it helps to see it done live. So I'm gonna go do it live. So, Let's just say for the moment that I have two binary variables. So x1 and x2 are both 0, 1 variables. Now, uh, in real life, of course, not all variables are 0, 1 variables, but I think the math behind an interaction is easiest to understand if we just start with, with 0, 1 variables. If you understand this, then taking it up to um, multiple values with, um, you know, e even perhaps a numerical, uh, one of these being numerical and the other one being categorical, becomes easier to understand. But we're going to start out with this. Now, I'm going to um, start out with what is called an additive model. So an additive model is nothing new to us. It's just why is some additive function of these two um, uh, you know, x's. So let's say that this is just beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. I'm going to go make myself a table of values. So let's say we have x1, we have x2, and we have y. So if x1 is 0 and y and x2 is 0, uh, go plug 0 and 0 into this. My y is just b naught. 
Um, now let's say that x1 is 1, but x2 is 0. So then I get beta naught plus, okay, beta 1 times 1 is just beta 1, and then there's a 0, so the last term gets zeroed out. If I have 1, 0, I have, well, beta naught plus 0, so that second term goes away. This one is just beta 2. That's a beta 2. And if they're both equal to 1, um, what is my estimate? Well, it's beta naught plus beta 1 plus beta 2. And let's go graph this. So this is my x1 axis. This will be my y axis. Let's call this 0, and we're going to call this the value 1. So I'm going to make myself a line for when x2 is equal to 0. So what does that line look like? Well, um, if x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 0, I end up with just the intercept. If I go one unit to the right on x1, this, this value right here is beta naught plus beta 1. And so you can think of the slope as being beta 1. Now again, this is the line for x2 equal to 0. So that's how, how does x1 affect y when x2 equals 0? All right, now let's do the same line when x2 is equal to 1. And let's just say that my beta 2 is positive. So um, when x1 is 0 and beta 2 is 1, I end up with this point, beta naught plus beta 2, which is the value right here. You can think about the distance. So how much does the intercept get shifted up? The distance between those intercepts is beta 2. Really important to understand that. Now, if I have x2 equal to 1 and I have x1 equal to 1, I'm going to get something that looks like this. Okay, this slope right here is still going to be beta 1. And we can think about the value of this point being beta naught plus beta 1 plus beta 2. And that's exactly what we found there. So remember, this is the line for when x2 is 1. So this is like you didn't stir your coffee. This is where you did stir your coffee. Now, there's a very important thing to recognize about this plot. I'm going to draw it like this. Note the lines are parallel. And you know, if you you know you can think through the math of why they're parallel, you know, I've just shifted this line up by exactly beta two. Alright, so um, I've just shifted everything up. And um, another thing to note is this, um, the effect of x1 on y does not depend on x2. Okay, so uh, what's the effect of x1 on y? Well, it's always a slope of beta 1. doesn't matter if x2 is equal to 0 or x2 is equal to 1, the effect is the same. Okay, so this, this is really just review of what we did with simple linear regression, um, but maybe it's a slightly different um, way to view it on, on the graph this way. And so I've made these two points. Now, off to the right, I'm going to have an interaction model. Now, what's my interaction model? Well, we're going to have y is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. And here's where the nonlinearity is going to come in. So plus beta 3 x1 x2. So I'm going to take a product of my two x's. Now let's go make the same table of values that we had before. So we're going to start with 0, 0. My y is still beta naught. 
if I go one zero, my um, uh, predicted value is still beta naught plus beta one. If I have zero one, nothing changes. Okay, so all this is kind of boring. It's just beta beta naught plus beta two. Where things change is when both the values are one. Okay, so in this case, it's going to be beta naught plus beta two, plus beta one, plus beta two, plus beta three. So just notice that when either one of these x's are zero, this last term goes away because you know you put a zero in either place, the whole term goes away. The only time we get to add beta three is when both my x1 and my x2 equal one. So let's go draw this. So again, this will be my x1 axis, this will be my y axis. Here's the value zero, here's the value one. And we'll just kind of copy what we did before. Um, this is beta naught. If we go um, uh, move, you know, a, a run of one, the rise is going to be beta one. And so this value right here is beta naught plus beta one, as we had before. Um, this is, again, our line when x two is equal to zero. Now, let's go do this for when x2 is equal to one. So I'm going to take a point right here. Um, this is going to be beta naught plus beta two. The difference between those two intercepts is beta two, so beta two tells us the difference between the intercepts. All right, now, Here's the new part. What is the value of y when both x1 and x2 equal 1? All right, so because x2 equals 1, um, we start out up here. And I'm going to put a dotted line where we had something before, which was beta one. Okay, so this is what we had before, which was there's beta naught, and then we have beta two, and then we have beta one. And this line would be parallel to this line. But that's not the answer. The answer is we have to, we also get to count beta three. So we get this extra bonus, if you will. So I'm going to put a, uh, a, a you know a, another point up here. This is the value beta three, and so um, we have a different line. This is the now the line when x two is equal to one. So a couple things that are really important. Uh, so number one, the lines. Well, my lines aren't parallel, but um, I'm going to write it slightly differently. The lines are parallel when beta 3 is equal to 0. Otherwise, they are not parallel. Beta 3 not equal to 0 implies not parallel. All right. So in this case, my beta 3 is positive. So that beta 3 is positive. And notice that beta 3 makes the lines not parallel. If beta 3 were negative, you know, if, if we had a negative beta 3, it would go down like this, and they would not be parallel either. Um, but we have kind of a, a condition now that establishes when, um, when we have an interaction. So not parallel means no interaction. Parallel means, um, all right, sorry, not parallel means there is an interaction. Not parallel is no interaction. Now, um, let's just go take some partial derivatives for a second. What is the partial derivative of y? And let's just do it with respect to x1 for now. 
Well, this is equal to beta 1. Then we take the derivative of this, you end up with 0, um, plus, okay, beta 3 times x2. So notice the way that x1 is related to y depends on x2. So the relationship between y and x1 depends on x2. So if, um, if x2 is 0, well, then you just get beta 1. If x2 is 1, the relationship is, well, beta 1 plus beta 3, which is that other slope. All right, so um, let me kind of summarize the, the, the key points. Whenever you have um, parallel lines, you have an additive model, and what that means is there is no interaction. When you have non-parallel lines, um, what that means is you have an interaction, and the way we can test for that is by looking at this beta 3 coefficient. Whenever that beta 3 is non-zero, we have an interaction. All right, so if we come back to my course packet, I've, um, I, I, I did all of that math for you here. How do we do interactions in R? Well, R and any decent statistical software program makes it very easy to test for interactions. Um, so one operator, in fact, the only operator we've been using so far has been the plus sign. The plus sign gives us an additive model. Um, to specify an interaction, we're going to use the colon operator. So either, either the colon operator or the star operator. So colon means make a product between x1 and x2. Um, the star operator means something slightly different. So the star operator means I want the product between x1 and x2 plus I want x1 and x2 as additive effects. Okay, so think about, you know, in my model, what do we have here? Well, we had the linear effect of x1, the linear effect of x2, and then the product of x1 and x2. And so the star notation is really handy. It, it, it says, give me the interaction plus the, what, um, this is called a main effect. So you know, this is the main effect of x1, this is the main effect of x2. I want the interaction plus the main effects. Now we can do a lot of other variations of this. So for example, if I had three predictors A, B, and C, I could put those in parentheses and then square the whole lot. And then, um, you know, this equals the main effects A, B, and C as additive effects, plus all the three possible product terms that, uh, that could happen. Um, we can also do things like drop an interaction. So sometimes we want, might want to uh, only have um, the interactions between A and C and B and C we're not interested in A, in A and B, so you can use the minus operator to get rid of one. A couple other things. Uh, we've already seen the I function, which we used for specifying quadratic effects. Um, we often want to use categorical variables. We've seen this before, but you can cast it as a factor with the as factor command, and then drop one does what you would expect it to do. All right. Let's go look at an example now. So we have some company that prepares students for taking the ACT exam. And the way they've traditionally uh, taught students to prepare them is they, um, they bring them into a classroom. So we'll call that the tradition, traditional classroom. And they come into the classroom, you know, a couple times over a 30-day period. Now this this company is experimenting with, um, with two, you know, variations of this. So one is, could we do a condensed course? Do you really need 30 days or could we kind of do an intense 10-day course? 
and they're also considering a different modality. So instead of the traditional classroom, they're going to go to an online distance curriculum. And so then the question is, um, how do these two different factors, so the length of the course and the modality, affect student performance? So what they did is they took 40 students who signed up for their program and they randomly assigned them to these two combinations. So either they had traditional or online, and they, ha they either had the condensed or the regular uh, length uh, version. So um, let's go uh, over to R for a second. And so uh, I'll just show you what that data set looks like. This is our, our data set. Um, there is a very um, handy command, which is this interaction plot. So let's go, um, let's go type this in. I'm going to go copy it in instead of typing everything. And um, I'm going to do one more thing. I, I like to change the colors just to make it uh, in, in, enhance the visual contrast. So if I say color equals 1 colon 2, that means uh, use colors 1 and 2 for the different lines. And uh, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that it shows up before I hit enter. So let's go hit enter. And so this is our interaction plot. This is exactly what we were viewing over on the paper. And let me just walk you through this. This is the performance of the students. I have the length on the x-axis, as I listed that first over here. And then I... Uh, I, I have different lines. So the red solid line is for the online course. The black dashed line is for traditional. And so what, it, what you should first notice about this plot is that the lines are not parallel. So that indicates that we've got an interaction here. Um, we should interpret this in an interaction. And so what I mean by this is, what you know? What is the effect of uh, you know the length of the course on performance? And the answer is it depends. So it depends on the type of of, um, of um, modality. So what I'm seeing here is that if you have a regular length course and you're using the traditional classroom modality, students do very well. Um, if you do the condensed version with the with the traditional class, students don't do very well. Um, on the other hand, if you use the online modality with the condensed version, students do really well. In fact, they do almost as well as the regular version. Uh, they don't do as well using the 30-day version. So there's something, you know, about uh, about the modality and the length that, that kind of interact with each other. Um, so just to kind of reemphasize my interpretation here, if I said, well, what's the effect of length on performance? The correct answer is it depends. So um, the effect of length on performance for traditional is increasing. The effect of length when the modality is online is actually decreasing. So this is a very extreme version of, a, of an interaction in that it, you know, it completely changes direction. All right, let's go back to the course packet and we'll just interpret what's here. So um, the interaction plot kind of tells the whole story. The problem with the interaction plot is you don't know if anything is significant. So, you know, could, could it be that these lines point in different directions just because of sampling variation? If I had, if I'd had different students, would they still point in different directions? So we really need to do a, a, a significance test. The way we do this is we fit a model, so ACT tilde, and remember we use the star operator to inter indicate an interaction. And so when I do this, and if I, if I, uh, if I, if I use the summary, what you're going to see is that I get something that looks like my um, uh, extra sums of squares that we talked about in a previous lecture. So this is the type effect, the length effect, and the interaction effect, each one has a single degree of freedom. All right, so let's um, interpret this a little bit more. So if we, if we go down to the bottom, we actually have our, um, uh, our, our, our estimated terms. 
So I'm going to go over to my document camera, camera and just write out uh, the estimated regression equation for us here. Um, so I think I'm going to need to move this up so I can see it. All right. So here's my estimated regression equation. So we could say your ACT predicted value is equal to the intercept, which was 21.9 plus 5.1 times online plus 6.0 times the length of the course. So that's the regular course. That's a dummy variable that takes the value 1 if it's regular. Minus 11.7 times online. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just write an X as times uh, regular, regular. All right. Now, um, what's really um, useful is to do a test on this term. So this was like my beta 3 when I, uh, when I was writing out the equation. So if I test beta 3 equal to 0, and what that means is no interaction. Okay, so if, if you review back here, whenever beta 3 was equal to 0, that means the lines were parallel and I don't have an interaction. The alternative is going to be that beta 3 is not 0. Therefore, I have an interaction. All right, so I, I really want to test that hypothesis. Now, my, my estimate of beta 3, so you can call that B3, is minus 11.7, but could that have just happened by chance? That, that's really what, what we want to know. So um, let's go back to my course packet for a second. And um, if we look at our output, we have the p-value for that effect. Okay, so the p-value is um, 0 0.0000189. So if, if we look back on the document camera, I just uh, wrote that down. This is way less than you know 5% if we use that as a cutoff. So we're going to reject H0. So I like to cross things out. Our conclusion is um, the interaction is real. So the lines really are not parallel. Not parallel. There is an interaction. All right, so, you know, again, the, the interaction plot is, is, is really telling the story. But if we want to, um, to nail this down, we do the, um, th that uh, test. Just going to mention one more thing. Um, there's a, we can compute the means. So the means can be found with, um, with, with a library called dplyr. And I strongly encourage you to learn about dplyr. It's, um, it's one of the most useful um, uh, packages for, for data preparation. We're going to come back to it uh, very soon when we talk about feature engineering. So this is very SQL-like. Uh, I'm going to take my data frame, and I can pipe it to dplyr. And I'm going to say group by type and length. So what that means is for every unique value of type and length across, you know, across those two, I want you to do a summarization. What sort of summarization do I want you to do? Well, let's go find the, uh, the counts and the means. And so what we have here uh, are the four means of the um, you know, combinations of type and length. Now, what's, um, what, what's useful is to compare the coefficients with these means. Notice the intercept is just when you have a traditional course with condensed length. So traditional classroom, condensed length. Um, we'll do another one here. Where does um, 5.1 come from, 5.1? 
So um, what we're going to do is take 21.9 plus 5.1. So in my head, that's about 27. So that's where you have an online course that's still condensed. And so 21.9 plus 5.1 is 27. Okay. What, what, is, what does 6 do? Well, if you take 21.9 plus 6, you get 27.9, which is sitting right here. Then, you know, how do we get 21.3 from these numbers? Well, I'll add all four of them up. You will get 21.3. That's enough for this video. Um, I'm going to have another video that will do the orange juice and the capacitor examples uh, so you can watch those next.